In this video, we're going to talk about the L-type calcium channel, and specifically, we're going to talk about the CAV 1.2 channel, which is the cardiac exoform of the L-type calcium channel. And the reason we're going to do this is try to bring some understanding to how that CAV 1.2 channel works and exactly its relationship to, say, something like a calcium channel blocker. So we're going to look at the CAV 1.2 channel, and again, that's the cardiac isoform of an L-type calcium channel. So we're looking at L-type calcium channels here. And the L-type calcium channel is going to play a role in a few different areas. One is we're going to see it in our AV node and our SA V node. So it does have some nodal principles. And when we're talking about the AV node and the SA node, typically we're talking about L-type calcium channels playing a role in phase zero. So that's where we actually see kind of this depolarization. So we're going to specifically be looking at this area here. So your L-type calcium channel or this CAB 1.2 channel is going to play a role here in depolarization. And then specifically when we're talking about our myocardial action potential, we're going to be concerned about that L-type calcium channel when we're looking at the plateau phase. So we're specifically looking at the plateau phase here. That is where we're going to see the function of the L-type calcium channel. So two different areas. So we're looking at nodal tissue, the AB node or the SA node. We're talking about phase zero, primarily driving depolarization of those nodal cells. And then we're looking at the myocardial cells. We're looking at the plateau phase. So this would be the myocardium that we're seeing the activation of these channels in. Either way, activation of these L-type calcium channels is going to be the primary, the predominant mechanism through which calcium enters our cells. So this is what's going to allow for calcium influx and is going to be the primary mechanism that we're going to discuss when we're talking about this L-type calcium channel. So what's interesting about this CAV 1.2 channel is we can see that there are a number of different domains as well as different subunits. So the first thing that we'll kind of take a look at is that we have four domains. So very similar to our sodium channel, there are four domains and those domains are going to wrap around the membrane to essentially create a pore. So what we can do is we can actually think of these as a cylindrical shape. So I want you to picture the subunits almost wrapping around in a more cylindrical shape. And then the movement of these domains and subunits is what's going to allow this pore to actually open and close. So what we have to be appreciative is that this pore can actually close in the membrane and it can actually be pulled open in the membrane as well. So we can see uh, opening and closure of the pore, which is going to be relevant for its function. So within each domain, we have six transmembrane segments and we can see that in each of these domains here. There, so there are six transmembrane segments. We'll focus fairly specifically on a few of these subunits, in particular the S4 subunit, the S5 and the S6 subunit, as well as some of the linkages between the domains. So if we take a look at the S4 subunit, as we can see here, the S4 subunits are going to play a role in the allosteric changes that we see. So as we start to reach the membrane voltage that is required to open the calcium channel, the S4 segment is going to be the primary physical modulator. So it's the movement of this S4 segment that's going to open the channel. So the calcium channels are typically going to respond around negative 40 millivolts. So we know that sodium is entering the cell and increasing the membrane potential. So as this membrane becomes more positive, the S4 segment will respond to this, and the way in which this S4 segment is going to respond is by outward movement. So during activation, what we see is this outward movement of the S4 segment, and that is going to actually functionally open the pore. So if we think about this cylindrically, so if we think about the pore as being, you know, a circle that is typically closed, so we have the inner mouth of the pore that looks like this, and typically it would be closed, and typically it would be closed, so conformationally um, our S5 and S6 subunit uh, would be positioned in a way that's not allowing for the pore to be open. What's going to happen is when we have the allosteric activation of S4, and we see that outward movement, so the S4 segment will move outwards. So if these are our S4 segments, we know that they're actually going to be pushed outwards as a result of that negative 40 millivolts or the response to depolarization that pulls them outwards. And what that will do is actually pull or conformationally pull open the subunits that are blocking the pore. And what is still critically relevant about those S5 and those S6 subunits is that their geometry makes calcium the preferred ion. So that is what's actually going to make this channel specific to calcium or give it its calcium specificity is that those S5 and S6 subunits are going to remain uh, in a conformation that makes calcium the preferential ion that's going to open through these channels. So in order to get ion channel opening, in order to see opening, what we have is an increase in resting membrane potential, which is going to lead to movement of the S4 subunit. So if we look at opening, the way that this channel opens is through an increase in membrane potential, or we see depolarization. And that depolarization is going to lead 
to allosteric changes or uh, mechanical changes in the S4 subunit. So we, what we see is the S4 moves outwards and that is going to open the channel. So the S4 segment moving outwards actually functionally opens this channel. So the piece that we can talk about are these S5 and S6 subunits. So again, the S5 and S6 subunits are going to play a role here because they are what's giving the channel its shape and ge internal geometry. So it's that shape and in internal geometry that is making this channel preferential to calcium. So we have to remember that the S5 and S6 subunits are important because they are going to give this channel a preference. And then we can talk about some of the linkages between these. So the first one that we'll talk about is the linkage between domain three and domain four. So there is is um, a cytoplasmic loop that connects domain three and domain four. Now what's relevant about this linker is that when we have an open channel, it is susceptible to conformation change. And what's going to happen there is that as we have opening of this channel and alterations in the way that the S5 and the S6 subunits are sitting, we start to see tension building. So tension builds within this cytoplasmic loop. And what will happen is as that tension builds, as conformation will change, it actually will begin to like to interact more with the S6 subunits of the other domains. And what can happen is it will flip up or uh, change conformationally where it will almost form a lid to the inner pore of the channel. So what we can see is as we have prolonged depolarization, so we start to see an increase in the membrane potential, we're starting to see lots of calcium entering into the cell, what will happen eventually is that cytoplasmic loop between domains three and four can actually flip up or we see a conformation change that will act as a hinged lid or closing element for this channel. And that is where we will see inactivation. So what happens during inactivation is functionally, or I guess structurally, the channel is still open, but we can no longer have calcium entering because this uh, cytoplasmic loop has moved into a position that no longer allows calcium to enter. So in inactivation, what we're seeing is a conformational change or conformational shift in the cytoplasmic loop between domain three and domain four. And again, why this is relevant is that we still have an open channel. Calcium can simply no longer make its way in because we've had inactivation. So not closure, inactivation because the cytoplasmic loop between domains three and four has become closed. <clears throat> Another factor involved in inactivation is these S5 and S6 subunits. Again, particularly, we're looking at the S5 and S6 subunits in domain three and domain four. And what happens is we're going to see the conformation change of the cytoplasmic loop, which will likely interact with the S6 subunits of domain three and domain four, and will pull them inwards. So we see those S5 and S6 subunits change their conformation, change the shape of the open channel. And now again, although we still are in the open phase, we still have this outward movement of those S4 segments. Conformation shift in these S5 or these S6 segments is leading to a actual uh, structural change in what this pore looks like and calcium can no longer enter. So the other relevant piece here is that we have the conformational shift of the cytoplasmic loop between domain three and domain four, which is not going to allow calcium to enter, even though the channel is technically in its open state. And we also have a structural shift or a geometric change in how the S6 subunits look. Again, two things leading to inactivation, which again, importantly means that the channel is open, but not except uh, calcium, is that we have this cytoplasmic loop is going to almost uh, take a hinged uh, lid conformation, or we see that conformation change that leads to tension building on this intercellular loop, which is then going to lead to it changing its shape or position and sliding over top of the open or inside portion of the pore. And the other piece that's going to be involved here is that as that tension is building and interaction is happening with the S6 subunits of domain three and domain four, their conformational change or change in geometric position is going to change the shape of the open pore and not allow calcium to enter. So we have an inactivated channel, not yet closed. And then finally, we would have closure of the channel. And closure is going to happen as we move back closer to our resting membrane potential. So essentially, closure will occur once the S4 subunit returns to its normal uh, state. So the S4 will retreat back into the intracellular space or will move inwards. And that inward movement is actually going to structurally close the pore, put it back in its resting state. And at that point, the channel would move towards its resting state where it is then ready to open again. So again, to recap what we're seeing here is we have a four domain subunit within our CAV 1.2 channel. Some of the relevant domains is the S4 domain. This is the domain that responds to changes in resting membrane potential. So as resting membrane potential goes up or membrane potential goes up as we have depolarization, that S4 subunit likes to move outwards or will move outwards, which will create structural changes in the S5 and S6 subunits. It's these structural changes that essentially open the channel or will move those subunits outwards to allow channel opening. And again, the geometric position of all of these items at this time is what allows calcium to enter and makes it specific to calcium. 
As we have prolonged depolarization and an increase in calcium ent entering the cell, we start to see tension building in the cytoplasmic loop that lives between domain three and domain four. And as that tension builds, we see a conformation change, which will change the position of the cytoplasmic loop, as well as the position of our S6 subunits. So the position change of the cytoplasmic loop it flips up. It does not physically obstruct the cell, so it's not the same as our, say, IFM motif in our sodium channels, but its positioning makes it enough that calcium can't really fit through as well. The other piece is that the change in the S6 subunits also changes, almost think of it like a lock and key mechanism. It changes the shape a little bit so it's open, but calcium can't fit through there. So um, we have a channel that is open, but is now inactivated because calcium can't move through. As we then move towards repolarization, We'll see resting membrane potential going back to normal. We'll see closure of this channel, and then we'll be in the resting state ready for opening it. Now, why this is going to be relevant is because when we're talking about calcium channel blockers, so something like verapamil or detizam, it actually preferentially binds to those S6 subunits when they are in their inactivated conformation. So it's actually the inactivated conformation that changes the inner pore shape, making verapamil and deltizam preferentially want to bind to that shape. So it's that functional change that's important for allowing those calcium channel blockers to actually sneak into that pore and bind and then perform their function by locking the S6 uh, helices in their closed shape. So we're actually taking advantage of inactivation by allowing calcium channels to bind in this state. So again, the relevance here is that uh, this is actually going to be where calcium channel blockers are going to perform their function. Now, you might be asking why this is relevant, and it's relevant for a couple of reasons. One, in the nodal tissue, this is what is leading to depolarization and allowing for activation of the myocardial cells. It's actually driving the action potential forward so that we can see the all or nothing response in our myocardial tissue. Now, when we look at the myocardium, we know it's playing an important role in the plateau phase. Um, so what we're actually seeing here is that that calcium influx is opposing our potassium efflux, which gives us this plateau. And we know that what is happening here is contraction. So the big key element to this is ventricular contraction. So so it's relevant because it's what allowing for the release of calcium from our uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum and activating actin and myosin and actually leading to ventricular contraction. So let's take a look at what is actually happening there. So we now know how this channel opens and we know that the ultimate consequence of this channel opening is that we have calcium influx. And again, here we're talking very specifically about the myocardial tissue and why this is relevant. So in the myocardial tissue, we start to see the calcium entering. And what's relevant is that calcium is going to enter in a really sensitive area. So this is where the T-tubules are going to be well spaced between the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're actually shoving a whole bunch of calcium into that tiny space between the T-tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's that increase in calcium. So it's not actually the voltage change. It's the increase in calcium, which is particularly relevant here in allowing for opening of our RYR2 channels. And what's relevant is that that calcium increase, so this build of calcium around this RYR2 complex or receptor is what's going to trigger opening and then efflux of calcium from that RYR2 receptor. So we see this is all happening, allowing for calcium influx. Calcium is going to enter those myocardial cells preferentially around those T-tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What we're gonna see from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which I have in red here, is that we're going to or sorry, trigger those RYR2 receptors, which is gonna lead to massive efflux of calcium. So now we actually see the calcium levels going up much, much higher. So two things are happening here. We know that the influx of calcium is actually counterbalancing or opposing the efflux of potassium that we see during this stage. So this is going to give us one, the plateau that we see. And the other benefit is that it's going to buy us time in activating the RYR2 receptor, leading to this massive efflux. So we start to see this really big efflux of potassium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is going to be what is allowing this calcium to bind to the triple proponent C, pull that triple proponent C away and allow for the cross bridging of actin and myosin and allow for uh, myocardial contraction. So again, two really relevant things here is one, we need that calcium influx to continue. So we see that calcium influx continuing across this plateau. So we get this plateau phase where we're not seeing repolarization yet. The other piece that's important here is that as that calcium influx comes in, it builds the cellular or the intracellular concentration of calcium between the T-tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what's relevant about that is that's how we see activation of this RYR2 complex. So this is how we're actually seeing the activation of this RYR2, which is allowing big, big efflux of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we get tons of calcium out here, and then it's going to bind to the 
troponin C, which is going to allow for the activation of our actinomycin bridges and actually give us that strong contraction that we see in the ventricles. So hopefully this provides some perspective on the CAB 1.2 channel or the L-type calcium channel. Again, we've broken down what the subunits look like, what their function is in terms of opening and activation and closure, how they actually perform a role in both the nodal tissue and the myocardial tissue, and what that actually looks like from an electrical, chemi electrical chemical perspective when we're looking at calcium influx, the plateau phase, and how this interacts with the RY, R2 complex in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to trigger that intense myocardial contraction. So it's all about calcium, calcium influx into the cell, building calcium concentration around the T tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, activating that RYR2 complex, leading to more intracellular dumping of calcium, which is going to allow for uh, activation of troponin C, pulling that away uh, and allowing for cross bridging.